All right, so this is the Bible in seven passages. The Bible in seven passages. Today, lesson number two, passage number two. Uh, and passage number two is Genesis chapter three, verses one to 24. This is part one of this particular passage that we're going to do. Uh, and I call this God's promise to fallen man. God's promise to fallen man. Now in our previous lesson, I asked you to imagine a world where because of various forces, the Bible was no longer available. That's the premise for this course. Based on various social and technological developments, the reading and sharing and teaching of the Bible was severely limited to the point that no full text version was, uh, was available anymore. I said in such a situation, I, I proposed that one way to keep the essential message of the scriptures alive and productive was to maintain seven key passages from the Bible that would summarize everything contained in the Bible. That was our exercise, that was the, the challenge of this class. So in the first lesson of this series, we looked at the very first of these seven passages, and that was Genesis 1.1. If you were going to have only seven passages, the first one I chose would be Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, in our study of this foundational verse, we learned that it not only explained that on the first day of creation, God called into existence the building blocks of existence, time, space, matter. The simple 10 words of this verse also refuted 13 major philosophies that tried to explain the existence and the condition of the world without reference to God. I'm not going to go over all of that. You can go back and look at that lesson for that information. Uh, Genesis chapter one, verse one is often referred to as the foundational verse of the Bible because it not only is the most read verse of any book in history, but if believed, it sets the stage for the most productive and satisfying study of the entire Bible itself. So this then brings us to the second of seven passages that summarize the Bible, and that is Genesis uh, chapter three, verses one to 24, as I say, the passage of promise. Now, our first verse, Genesis 1.1 of the seven, uh, it provides information. In other words, from the first verse, we learn where the world comes from. Where does the world come from? Well, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We understand where it comes from, from Genesis 1.1. The second of the seven verses, Genesis 3 verses 1 to 24, provides the explanation for how the world and the human race ended up in its present condition. Now this is a, a bit of a long passage, but easy to remember because it is a narrative involving four individuals, God, Satan, Adam, and Eve. In its 24 verses, three key ideas are introduced that will inform all that will be written afterwards. First of these is the reason for mankind and the creation's fallen state. See, at some point in everyone's life, they realize that they are not perfect and they live in a world where others are also imperfect and the natural world around them is also flawed and dysfunctional as well. People write books, they write songs, they make movies based on the fallen nature of mankind and the slow but steady degeneration of the environment. We call it the creation, same idea. The Bible, however, reveals that the original cause for this imperfect world and imperfect human nature is disobedience to God's commands resulting in sin and its destructive consequences. This truth is eloquently wrapped 
in the origin story of Adam and Eve's temptation and fall. And this is why I chose this as the second of the seven verses uh, that will explain the entire Bible. So we read Genesis 3, the very beginning in verse one, it says, now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Here we only learn about the serpent's true identity, Satan, later on in the Bible. In John chapter 8, verse 44, Revelation 12, verse 9. In this scene, however, the serpent is presented as being crafty and his deceitful nature is immediately on display as he begins to speak. And what does he say? And he said to the woman, indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And so verse 1b begins with not just a question, but a subtle questioning of God's authority and goodness. Has God really said this, he says or asks? Is he really serious about this command? The inference, of course, is that he has denied you something that could be good for you. Now in this passage, we learn uh, what has originally transpired that we didn't read. We learn from this verse that there's been a command not to eat of certain fruit. We've learned that. We haven't read it, but we learn it from this passage. And now we see the seduction of the serpent in his effort to get Eve to eat of the tree and disobey God's original command. It's interesting, the method is the very same today, isn't it? The temptation to doubt that God really means what he says and the suggestion that what God forbids is actually good and pleasant for you. The idea that you know, God is just trying to spoil your fun. Now, in the garden there were two trees, two special trees, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. One tree prepared Adam and Eve for the other tree. If they did not eat of one, they would then get to eat of the other. The lesson that free will needed to learn was that obedience to God's laws result in eternal life. Adam and Eve failed to learn that lesson and Genesis 3 is the story of that failure. I call it Eve's five mistakes. Let's go through Eve's five mistakes, shall we? Mistake number one, she compromised with a rebel. The woman said to the serpent. We notice here, not only does Eve respond to a rebel sinner and try to reason with him, she became part of the rebellion by condescending to talk with him. She should have rebuked him, but she tolerated the serpent's challenge to the order of things and began immediately to take a weaker position. She could have acted like Michael, the archangel, who went in dispute with the devil, simply declared, the Lord rebuke you, Jude verse nine. He did not engage with the evil one. And so she compromised with a rebel instead of rebuking him. Mistake number two, she changed God's word. We read, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, she says, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. So she attempts to correct the serpent's question, but in her answer, you can see that the damage has already been done. In her answer, she both adds and subtracts from God's word. She makes God more restrictive and demanding than he really is, thus reinforcing what Satan was suggesting. 
God had said, you may freely eat. Eve said, we may eat. God gave them full rights, abundance. She said all they had was access. There's a difference. Eve said that you could not touch, but God did not restrict touching. To examine and understand what was forbidden was okay. It was to partake that was forbidden. Changing God's word to be too strict or too liberal is wrong. We tend to think that being too strict is a safeguard against liberalism, but to change either way is a violation. She was too strict. Mistake number three, she considered the offer. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, had Eve rebuked Satan at this point, the matter would have been closed and history, of course, would have been much different. Note that the temptation is the same one that led to Satan's own fall. You will be like God. Eve discusses the matter with Satan, thus considering his proposal. This makes him bolder. When you don't put down someone's evil idea or action, what happens? They become more ambitious and they double their attempt to win you over. Now Satan does not question the law, he actually accuses God of jealousy and dishonesty. He says that God's a liar. You know, he says it's not that you're going to die, it's that you're going to be like God. And he says that God is jealous, but jealous in an evil way. He lied to you because he doesn't want you to be like him. He makes the way of the curse the way of the blessing. Good is evil and evil is good. Doesn't that sound familiar? <laughs> Aren't things happening today in our own society where, where that's making your head explode? When people say, uh, that, that little baby there that survived its abortion, uh, it's not a, <laughs> a college student actually said in an interview or in a debate that it wasn't a real baby, it wasn't a real human being because the mother had not yet decided if it was to live or not. <laughs> I mean, I'm hearing, I'm actually hearing this on the radio, I'm hearing this person say this. Like I said, I, my head was exploding. Come on, you got to be kidding. Well, evil is good. Good is evil. There's nothing new about the process. So in considering the offer, Eve was opening herself up for temptation at three levels. She was opening herself up, <clears throat> excuse me, for physical temptation. It's good for food, something that appeals to the senses, something that is pleasurable. Emotional temptation, it was pleasant to the eyes, something beautiful aesthetically, something that moves you. And spiritual temptation, a desire to make one wise, an appeal to one's mind and intellect and pride, to have special insight or special vision. John the Apostle, he talks about these three areas of temptations, doesn't he? In 1 John 2, 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world, demonstrating that what is written here in Genesis is timeless. It works in every generation. Jesus faced 
the same threefold temptations in the desert. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they had ended, he became hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, men shall not live on bread alone. And he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall be yours. It shall, it shall all be yours. Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And he led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands, they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Physical appetite, Jesus was hungry. Emotional desire, the possession of the world and all of its kingdoms. Spiritual pride, having special protection from the angels. And so Eve was attacked at all three levels at the same time, and she considered and she pondered these things. What should she have done? I mean, I know it's hindsight. <coughs> Nevertheless, for our own edification, what should she have done? Well, first of all, she should have stood firm. A rebuke, a firm stand, not to compromise. A stand based on the protection of God's armor, which is the word and the spirit. Not a discussion or a consideration or a negotiation, but a, stand for, a firm stand is what she, uh, she needed. As James says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. She should have uh, run away, another option. Paul says to Timothy, now flee from youth, youthful lusts and pursue righteousness and faith and love and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Psychologists tell us that we have two basic reactions to danger and that is to fight or to fly away, to run away. Depending on the circumstances and our assessment of the situation, we choose one or the other. Sometimes the temptation is too great for our strength. Sometimes we may be misunderstood. It's better to run away than to risk being seduced. What does Solomon say? For whoever is joined with all the living, there is hope. Surely a live dog is better than a dead lion. Good advice. Eve did neither of these. She did not make a strong stand, nor did she run away for protection. She stopped, she admired, she considered. She said to herself the famous words of the 21st century, why not? Why not? Her fourth mistake, she disobeyed. She challenged God. Every disobedience is a challenge to God. She took from its fruit and ate. No matter what Satan said, no matter how attracted she was, no matter how mixed up the serpent made the situation, the bottom line was that with her own mouth she had said that she understood what the instruction was. She even explained it to the devil. We've been told not to eat. So she knew what the instruction was. Here is where her, her will came into being. She chose to believe Satan regarding the situation rather than believing God. She liked his explanation of how things were more than what God said about how things are. I heard what God said, but now I'm listening to what you're saying and I kind of like your interpretation better. There was nothing in Eve that pushed her to sin. There was no weakness of flesh like us that led her to sin. 
She sinned because she chose to disregard God's word. Although her sin was more serious because she had received much, it was not any different than our own today. We sin when we challenge God with our disobedience. I often say to, to people when, when they're trying to work something out in their mind about a situation, especially if it's a, a moral decision, you know, I say, listen, if you had a test, if you had a written test, and one of the questions on the written test was, should you do this or should you not do this? How would you answer that question, yes or no? You know, if it was a test, most of us would say, well, I, you know, I, I'm pretty sure I would put no, because I, down deep inside I know this is not right. Down deep inside, she knew what she was doing was not right, was not what God had told her that she ought to do. And so, aside from mistake number four, disobedience, one more mistake, she led Adam to sin. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate, Genesis 3.6. As a prototype of all sinners, once Eve has sinned, she leads Adam to sin with her. Misery loves company. She goes from being God's defender to Satan's helper. Now there's so many questions about this. For example, why did Adam also eat? So many reasons that we can surmise. Because he loved her, because he wanted to share her punishment. Of course, this would make Adam noble in sinning, and this concept is not a biblical concept. We don't know what went through his mind other than the fact that he was not deceived like the woman was. We know that from 1 Timothy 2.14. All we know is that he also chose to disobey God. He probably had the same arguments put to him, but this time by his wife rather than by the serpent. Eve was deceived because Satan seduced her in the guise of a serpent. Adam was convinced by the person that he knew and loved. He may have thought all was lost anyway. You know, disbelief and distrust of God. Either way, the result was disobedience to God, this time by Adam. So I want you to note that the five mistakes of Eve are a preview of the stages that each of us go through when we fall into temptation. Number one, our failure to rebuke sin when it presents itself. You know, sinfulness is usually attractive and desirable or powerful, and our lack of quick and decisive action at its first appearance is usually our downfall. An effective rebuke requires several things. First, knowledge of what is truly good and evil. I know this is wrong. No, I'm not doing that. I'm not thinking that. Conviction of our own position, I have no doubt that what I know about this is accurate. And immediate response. I mean, you call a spade a spade immediately. I mean, let's just pick something easy, okay? We'll pick something not embarrassing, but easy. You're with four or five other people and someone starts talking and saying, guess what I heard? Did you hear about June, there's nobody in the church here that I know called June, so it's a safe name. <laughs> it doesn't count if it's your middle name, okay? <laughs> so did you hear about June? I'm thinking she's having an affair. I'm not sure, but I think he's having an affair. And that, that oh, wow, that probably explains some of the things. I noticed they weren't sitting next to each other in church. Yeah, yeah. What is that called? Gossip. Yeah, that's called gossip. That's called gossip, malicious gossip too. Immediate response is what is required. 
And I pick gossip because we're all guilty of it. So you know, nobody's better than the other guy in this room. You know, it's, it's so easy to get into. Men do it too, believe it or not. That immediate response, somebody somewhere has to say, hey, come on, let's not, we don't know that for sure. We don't know that for sure. Let's, let's not do this, guys. Let's not do this. A better idea, let, let's pray for June. If that's a situation, I don't know what, let, let's offer a prayer for her now. You may be called, oh, Mr. Goody, oh, you're better, you think you're better than we are? You know, that type of thing. But failure to rebuke sin out of the gate, usually what gets us into the trouble. Normal stages of every fall, failure to rebuke sin. Compromising God's word. When we want to sin and still remain Christian, we simply change what God's word really says. There's a presidential candidate who calls himself a Christian homosexual. <laughs> And the news media refer to him as a devout, a devout Christian homosexual. Why is he a Christian homosexual? Because he uh, ascribes to a church and a theology and commentaries that excuse homosexuality. That's why. If we want to continue our bad habits, we simply either block them out of the Bible or we you know, find a way to make the Bible approve of them. And find a group that will accept and even applaud our sin. How brave you are to stand up as a devout Christian homosexual. Yeah. Third normal sage, we actually consider the pleasure of sin. When we don't rebuke sin right away, what we end up doing is trying it on for size. You know, don't go for a test drive of a car if you're not going to buy the car because you are going to desire it if you try it out. <laughs> the guys who sell cars, you know, they, they just want you to get into the showroom, that's all, especially men. They just want to get you, that's why you get the, the stuff in the mail. This key you can unlock, you could win a boat. You know, why would I want a boat? I don't have a car to pull a boat. Yeah, we can fix that. <laughs> they just want to get you into the showroom. Now, it's not, selling cars not immoral, I'm just saying, that that's the method. If they can get you in, and then if they can get you into the car itself, Oh, smell that new car, smell. It's intoxicating, isn't it? Someone told me that new car smell, glue. It's the glue in the, in the thing that's holding everything, but anyways. But this is the salesman's basic approach to get you hooked. Get in, you want to take it for a drive? You don't have to buy it, just take it for a drive. Don't play with sin in your heart because pretty soon you're going to buy it. You're going to act it out. Number four, consent. If we do not initially refuse to sin, we will eventually give in to it. There are only two ways to go. You do or you do not. And if you do not say no, then with time you'll eventually say yes. The trick is to decide ahead of time that you will say no. Then when you're faced with temptation, you will not weaken yourself by considering the pros and cons. You'll just say, no, yeah, we don't do that. I don't do that. And then of course, same thing. We start a club. <laughs> I go back to gossip. You know, people who like to gossip, they hang together because nobody's, you know, nobody in the club is going to call on each other. Nobody's going to call each other out on the gossip because we, we, we have this silent agreement that when we're together, we just, 
you know, we gossip. It's no fun to sin alone. And so the next step is always to find a sympathetic partner who will let you sin in peace or who will join you. Romans 1 verse 32 mentions this phenomena. Paul even says that the eventual state is that sinners who know they are doing wrong encourage others to do wrong and applaud them in their sins. This helps justify their position. Sin is the original problem and the method has always and will always be the same. It's always the same thing. Why did I choose this passage as one of the seven? Because it explains human nature, that's why. It explains perfectly how we got to where we are as human beings today. Now, <clears throat> In this uh, first section of passage number two, which is uh, chapter three, verses one to six, uh, as I've just mentioned, we find the reason why mankind and the creation is in its fallen state. Adam and Eve have disobeyed God's command and by exercising their free will in this manner, they have separated themselves from God. This separation from God which we call death, is the direct and automatic result of disobedience or sin against God. The natural consequence of separation from God is decay, destruction, the extinguishing of life. You know, you have a lamp and it's got a beautiful lampshade and it's an expensive ceramic base and it's got a, 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 a lead light in it that'll last you know, a thousand years. <clears throat> and it's plugged in and you know, it's beautiful. And if you, take, if you remove the plug from the wall, you still have the lamp and its beauty and its artistic design and everything's only one problem. It has no light. Why? Because you separated it from its life source, the electricity in the wall. You take a plant you, uh, you know, that has many uh, branches and flowers and whatever, and you take one of those branches and you cut it off and you pull it aside. That branch, it still has leaves and some of the flowers are still on it, but it's as good as dead, right? For a little while, it's still, you know, it's still the leaves are still green and the, and the flower is still blooming for a little while, but because you've separated it from its source of life, it's going to die eventually, just give it enough time, a day, a week, a month, but eventually it'll just dry up and die. The plant itself will continue to live, but that thing that you cut away from it, it'll die. Well, that's what happens with sin. Sin cuts us away, takes the plug out from the source of life, which is God. And we look like we're alive, we look like you know, we're okay, we're producing children, we're building buildings, we're living our lives for a little while but we are disintegrating, aren't we? We're decaying, aren't we? We call it cancer, but what is cancer? It's just the decay of the body. We're dying. We're in the process of dying. Why? Because we are, we're unplugged from the light source. We're cut off from the, from the tree of life, in this case, which is God. So this is the natural consequence of separation from God. Thankfully, this is not the end of this passage, nor is it the only thing that it teaches and reveals to us. So in our next class, we're going to review verses seven to 24, same passage, seven to 24, where the passage will describe both the negative and the positive ways that God has responded to man's disobedience. In these two actions, God laid out the natural consequences of man's disobedience and the promise that gave Adam and Eve, as well as every generation that came after them, a hope that not all was lost, a promise that made life on earth worth living. So verses one to six explains the fall of man Verses seven to 24 of this same passage will explain the promise from God to man. And we'll finish that uh, next week. Don't have time to, 
to take that. I only have a few minutes left in this class. So that's it for this week. Again, I, uh, this, this counts as only one passage, all right? So we're still going to finish up passage number two. Keep trying to guess what's passage three, four, five, six, and seven. I've had some of you come up to me and say, oh, you have to do this one or you have to do that one. You keep guessing and we'll, uh, we'll reveal them as we go through the, uh, through the course. Thank you for your attention.